this could be the future of Twitch streaming. Well, this, but better. It still doesn't entirely look great yet. Let's talk about why. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Get exclusive downloads of my sample clips I use for my comparison testing on my own streaming site Nebula, linked below. The OBS devs dropped a new OBS update on us while well, it's still in beta, the whole release candidate thing, but I wanted to cover it, talk about some of the new features as in some ways it's a small update, but it also has some pretty big features that some of you may have been looking for. And we're gonna run through them and then talk about one of them that is going to continue to be a point of discussion from like 2019 it started it's gonna continue into the future as it kind of represents the future of streaming in terms of the actual video encoding and decoding i'm ebuzzbox the stream professor and we're looking at obs studio 27.2 beta 2. this update introduces a few kind of smaller fixes and tweaks for example a slightly bigger one that only applies to like five of you out there is support for aja it's a company like black magic uh, capture and output devices. So think about if you heard of Blackmagic's, you know, deck link cards and things like that. Support for AJA cards have finally been added. AJA is one company of capture cards that has just been completely unsupported in OBS Studio, which doesn't happen very often, and it's because they work so fundamentally differently, like Blackmagic cards do. And I even remember I posted a video, or a couple videos in 2017, playing with an AJA Kona LHI uh, capture card and was really frustrated couldn't use it in OBS Studio. That has finally been added, so if you have some cheapo broadcast gear or you pick some up on eBay or you're looking for an option, they are super high quality cards. Now you can use them in OBS. And you can use them for output as well, which is pretty sick. There are some unique uses for that. A huge update that I'm super stoked for that will allow more customizability for overlays and graphics and visuals and things like that is they finally added blend modes for sources. Think of it like Photoshop. You can have different blend modes that can control how a specific source overlays or blends with a source below it, or I guess technically above it. So you, ha you can have things like overlay mode, screen mode, which removes black from backgrounds. That can really unlock some potential. Obviously, I don't have anything really to show, to show it to you right now, but, you know, it can help a lot with managing your graphics, and it allows kind of the next step. Uh, we've kind of been moving over the past few years to where you have to do less of your graphics creation or graphics design in an app like Photoshop or Krita or whatever, and you can actually just do it within OBS Studio itself, which is pretty neat. This is one more step closer to where you have more control and can adjust your individual elements a little more clearly here. The CEF, the browser source for OBS Studio, uh, this thing has been running on a super ancient build of Chromium for a long time. It's apparently been a huge issue to try to get it updated. It's finally been updated and they were it was so far behind that it got updated from version 75 or 3770 to 95, which is 4638. Most of those numbers aren't gonna mean anything to you, but it means that it's gonna be more compatible with browser sources, things like that, and hopefully fix some of the sign-in bugs things like that that have been plaguing OBS for a while. That also means we can have things like they just added a browser source refresh hotkey. So you can have a dedicated hotkey to refresh a specific browser source, which is lovely. Twitch panels. When you sign in with Twitch in OBS in order to show your chat, stream information, things like that, they will now automatically use the light or the dark theme based on what OBS theme you have selected, which is awesome. The volume meters in the audio mixer now turn gray whenever you have the source muted. To make it a lot easier to just ignore sources that are muted, you can of course hide them and stuff, but this is really neat. And it's also another visual indicator if you mute your microphone or something and you, you can glance down at it and notice and catch yourself before maybe you speak too much in your stream while you're muted, which is something I've, I've never done. Never at all, totally. The docs menu is now its own menu, which makes it a lot easier to get to, less clicks when you're managing a bunch of docs. Previously, this was under the view menu as a sub menu. Now it has its own top layer menu, which is pretty nice. The filter preview and properties window for adding filters to sources is now finally resizable. That drove me nuts for a very long time. I'm glad they finally changed that. Hotkeys got a couple more updates besides for the browser source one in that there is now hotkey duplicate detection. So if you set the same hotkey for multiple things, it's now going to tell you that so you don't mess stuff up which is fairly easy to do and there's now a search for hotkeys because more and more hotkeys keep added keep getting added and the more sources you have the more it exponentially scales the number of hotkeys available to your system so they finally added a search so you can easily find what you need which is lovely support for the rist protocol for video streaming has been added this stands for Reliable Internet Stream Transport, which is weirdly similar to SRT, which is Secure Reliable Transport, but it's another way for video to kind of be broadcast 
over the internet while still retaining high quality and low latency to kind of go between different nodes. So a node in this case would be say, I have a podcast guest on and I want them to stream their video feed to me for me to then add to my stream to then stream to you on Twitch or YouTube or what have you. That's usually been kind of messy. And we had NDI introduced that I've talked about a lot on the channel, which is a way to kind of stream video without needing wires within your home network or your local network. But doing that over the internet didn't really work. So that's where Secure Reliable Transport or SRT comes into play. Well, RIST seems to be very similar uh, and similarly named even and uses RTP or UDP transport layers to send video and can be used for similar things. I'm not sure you're really going to see a whole lot of real use cases for that in the kind of indie streamer space. But if you're doing big multi-person streams or you're doing kind of more company broadcast events, you might see some use cases for it. And it's great that OBS supports it. I hate talking about really cool broadcast tech and then just kind of being like, well, you're not going to use it because I can't necessarily conjure a reason you personally watching right now should care about it. But I, I, I do hope in the future to work with someone who actually utilizes it in their space like we have talked about with NDI and kind of have something to show for creative uses of it and things like that in the future. Over on the Linux side, uh, we did get Flatpak support officially for OBS Studio, which is great. And the framework has been developed and laid for background hotkey support on Wayland, which has been a nightmare so far. And then when you're adding a window capture source, the windows now sort ordered alphabetically. We do also have the big huge thing that I, I would be excited about for this update, and that is the introduction of AV1 encoders. I've talked about this so many times on the channel, but if you're unfamiliar, AV1 is an open source video streaming codec that A, aims to avoid all of the licensing fees and trademark issues and all of that, that HEVC or H265 and now H266 and other codecs have, which make it not useful for a lot of streaming services and dead on arrival, but it also aims to be like HEVC and other codecs, much higher quality per your pixel or more bitrate efficient, which means you can get higher quality at the same bitrate. Now I've talked about this back, starting mostly back when the NVIDIA Ampere architecture launched, the RTX 3000 series, gra series graphics cards, because they were the first ones to add decoders for this, meaning you could watch AV1 video and it would decode on your graphics card and play back smoothly. Well now AMD has AV1 decoders, Intel has AV1 decoders, so a lot of Android TV boxes do, TVs do, so we're reaching a point, phones are getting there, we're reaching a point where a lot of devices can consume AV1 now, which means it's time to start getting encoders so we can start producing that content. Now, there is still a demo available on Twitch of them streaming 1440p 120fps gameplay to Twitch in AV1 at low bit rates, and it looks phenomenal. However, I'm pretty sure this was a video upload more so than a stream, as the real-time encoders to actually do this are still not entirely there. So we get the introduction of two different encoders. Think of an encoder like a specific piece of software that encodes the video. So for H.264, you have NVENC, which runs on your graphics card, if you have NVIDIA graphics card, and you have X.264, which is a software H.264 encoder. There are multiple, there's like a bunch of AV1 encoders that are being developed simultaneously, all trying to get to the same goal of fast, but still super high quality. The downside has been, of course, that by being more bitrate efficient, they are much slower to encode. And previously, like in years past, you couldn't even encode real-time AV1 video at all on basically any hardware. It was always super slow. And as time progresses, it gets faster and faster, and they have finally reached a point where you can technically encode real-time video, and OBS is experimenting with integrating it into the software. Now, this is only for recording, but you do have the ability to test it and play with it right now, which is freaking awesome. I will say, especially based on the example I showed earlier, do not let what I show you now kind of sour your mood on AV1 in the first place because every encoder, as long as it's still in active development, changes and shifts. And existing codecs can still be optimized for specific workflows. For example, the reason NVENC H.264 performs as well as it does in terms of quality and things like that is because they've specifically fine-tuned the encoder using all sorts of fancy stuff to make it look good for gameplay and things like that, as well as introduce faster hardware on the graphics cards to encode it. So what we're looking at right now is the first iteration of available real-time AV1 software encoders. This does not represent the entire capacity of AV1 as a codec or what it can look like. There are two available. There's one called AOM and one called SVT. In my experience, the AOM one is going to be easier to run and you can, depending on your hardware, if you have like a Ryzen 30, 3900X or especially a 5900X or one of the big Threadripper CPUs, you're going to be able to run most of the AOM presets without issue. 
However, it looks worse than the other encoder at the same settings and bit rates, which is SVT. Now, SVT looks pretty great, but it is much harder to run. I am running on a Threadripper 3970X, so that is 32 cores, 64 threads, and I can only run the SVT AV1 encoder at the 8 setting, which is the default. They have like 8, 7, 6, and it's okay, slower, and too slow. And I can encode some gameplay on the 7, which is the slower setting, uh, but it eventually crashes because it can't keep up. And this is very similar to the X264 CPU usage pr presets where you have, you know, fast, faster, medium, slow, things like that. Very similar things. So I will say, doing a side-by-side -side comparison just with some basic Halo Infinite gameplay streamed to it, the SVT AV1 encoder, even on the 8 setting, looks markably better in specific finer details than NVENC does in a lot of use cases at the Twitch bitrate of 6 megabits per second for 1080p60. However, there are some scenarios where NVENC might look a little bit better because it's optimized to appear a little bit sharper and things like that. The AOM one doesn't honestly come close at the moment. That being said, once you start really getting into some of the finer details with NVENC and with X264 slow involved, it doesn't beat it out yet. It's not this magical pill yet, but that's yet. If you run on the super slow profiles, which you can't do in real time, but you know, if you encode the super slow profiles of AV1 and compare it to these codecs, it looks phenomenal. I've showed this many times. So what we're waiting on is some more optimizations and then GPU encoders. Because if you recall, back when NVENC first started gaining popularity and becoming, you know, huge, Part of the reason it was, was because it ran so fast because it was running on ASICs, which are dedicated specific instruction hardware on the graphics card dedicated for one purpose, video encoding. And so it could do that really, really fast because that's the only thing it could do. At the time, most people with just about any hardware on the market was not able to stream X264, X264 on any real high quality presets because it was just too intensive and we didn't have the hardware for it. So NVENC showed up faster to run and higher quality, and that was huge. Now, as the years have gone on, we've started to get the new Ryzen and the new uh, Intel 12th gen hardware and can run X264 slow and things like that a lot easier. NVENC is less impressive. It still competes with slow, but it's less impressive of a feat. But keep that context in mind when we're getting this software encoder that we're struggling to run at a high quality setting, we're still going to get GPU encoders that theoretically are capable of running faster and providing higher quality because they're going to run on dedicated chips designed specifically for that purpose. So this is going to be the future of Twitch streaming. Twitch has put a lot of eggs in this basket. So of Netflix, Apple, Hulu, all sorts of companies. We're going to get there. This is just like the very first iteration. Like imagine being around when everyone was streaming MPEG or MPEG2, I guess, and the first iteration of X264 or whatever was introduced. That's where we're at now. So we are on the forefront of a new encoder shift which hasn't happened in like 15 years or tw maybe 20. Like, it's wild. But I just want to point out that the quality comparisons are not going to blow your mind at this exact moment. By the way, if you want to have these exact like samples for yourself, because it is hard for people to encode these and things like that, to compare for yourself the pixel peep, because YouTube compression really wrecks a lot of this stuff, subscribers over on Nebula will get downloads to those assets. What's Nebula? Nebula is a creator-owned site. It is a video streaming site that I have built with my creator friends. My videos are higher quality there, ad-free, and often extended from the YouTube versions like our recent free OBS tools video or provide an extra download or asset or something like this video. Nebula features YouTube's top education creators such as Low Spec Gamer, love him, Thomas Frank, awesome dude, and who else? MKBHD, Legal Eagle, lots of awesome educational and awesome creators. And we got a lot of good content over there. There's Nebula Originals, there's podcasts like Low Spec Gamer's podcast Genesis, which I was on. But you know who also has educational content that's really good? Curiosity Stream. And they saw what we were doing on Nebula and they wanted to form an alliance. So we have actually bundled our awesome Nebula service, which features a lot of, you know, indie YouTube creators, along with Curiosity Stream's library of thousands of documentaries and educational content produced on a more like Hollywood kind of scale. And put the two sites together in one bundle, where you, if you sign up in the link below, you get access to both sites for just $14.79 a year. That's 26% off their annual plan. Phenomenal deal. And while you're there, go check out Crash Course, where Andre Meadows takes you through the history of gaming, going all the way back to ancient Egypt. That's awesome. Go check that out. Head to, head to curiositystream.com slash epos for the best deal in streaming. And yeah, get both sites for under $15 per year. That price should be illegal, but get it before it is. But yeah, like I said, it's not the biggest OBS update ever. Uh, I am happy to see that they do have some cool changes going on and things like that. There are some quality of life fixes here that a lot of people should be excited for. But overall, 
I'm just super stoked that we're finally getting to really test AV1 encoders and I'm so excited to see where it goes from here because literally this is the first time we can do it real time with a software like OBS. This is quite literally just the beginning. It can only get better from here and I am so excited. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hit the like button if you did. Subscribe for more tech education and stream guides. Remember, be kind, rewind. By the way, at the end of the video here, I know I'm not supposed to do a bunch of calls to action, but if you've been following my cool glitch art, things like that, we're doing my cool analog VHS glitch art. I've had some questions about it. I will have a video on the setup coming soon, uh, but if you want to follow it, I have a website dedicated to it now, glitchart.gg, and I have a dedicated Patreon I'm launching where you can get cool wallpapers, copies of the gifts and video clips, and even potentially get prints in the future and things like that over at patreon.gg or patreon.com slash glitch art as well. So go check that out if you're interested in supporting some cool art stuff. See ya!